Good morning. Beautiful day. Okay. We're already in October. Unbelievable. And it seemed like we're going to blink a couple times. We're going to be going into November. And then pretty soon we're going to hit that, that wonderful month of December. We'll start. Now, according to the weatherman, it's going to get cold on this day, whatever day it is. They're not talking about the cesarean ca calendar or some other calendar or some kind of a um, um, sundial, whatever it is. It'll happen when it happens. But definitely pray. Uh, of course, what happened over in North Carolina with the Hurricane Helene, uh, but then also the state of Florida um on the west coast where my sister lives uh they're expecting a cat between cat three and cat four uh hurricane uh this is the same area that two years ago was just almost destroyed by hurricane irma and uh they're already 20 inches above for the year for water and so uh they're expecting serious flooding say well flooding here is a little different. I mean, they're they're at sea level, and uh, their ground is mainly coral, coral base. Where in the Midwest it's more clay base, whereas the water just sits here for a while. There you have it, and then after a while, it eventually drains down if the water table will let it. And so, uh, definitely pray for those folks in in West Southwest Florida. And uh, pray for our country. What a what a mess our country in it is in, isn't it? We definitely need to pray. And the hope of this country is not the White House. The hope of the country is where Jesus is up in heaven. So He's the hope, and let's continue to pray for Him. He's the only one that can change hearts. And so, Mark chapter four, Mark chapter four, as we continue on the aspect about having the right type of heart, Mark chapter four. Verses 3 through 8, the word of God says this, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. <clears throat> and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the way, sighed, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and yielded no fruit. Another fell on good ground, and did yield fruit, and sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. The aspect of having the right type of heart, having the right type of spiritual soil, that is, the word of God is cast upon it, that it finds good ground. And in that good ground, which it takes, you've got to work it. It's, it's, it's constant care. Um, when you think about how this area is, you get rain in the springtime. And boy, I mean, before that, you've already got the farmers. They've got all the ground tilled up. And a lot of times they've already planted the seed. And they need that water to kind of just start the process. And, and then... Then they got. Then sometimes they got to go back in there, and they've got to uh, fertilize it, and then they got to all kinds of things to keep it going until harvest. And then harvest is a great time because all the fruit of their labor is there. Uh, but when you have no water, or you have other things like severe heat, or bugs, or whatever that can hurt the the harvest. In the spiritual realm, just like we see in the physical realm, if we don't monitor and keep an eye on our spiritual hearts, our spiritual lives, that weeds will grow up and destroy our lives. And so uh, it's it's a matter of working on. It's a matter of uh, diligence. It's a matter of having some spiritual discernment to know what is right and what is wrong. And we've been talking about that last couple of weeks. And um, we've talked about... Um, have, asking God for a new heart, have that soft heart, that pliable heart, so that this way we can be able to be effective for the Lord. But also, we need to guard our heart. I mean, there's so many enemies out of the Christian, that's the world, the flesh, the devil. And I'll say this, and I've said this many, many times, 
The devil knows more about you than you do yourself. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows what uh, causes you to respond. And he knows what, what it takes for you to say, you know what, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. He knows all that. And he uses that against us. And um, for example, I have been taught, I, brought, I was brought up with a work ethic. You work hard, you do your best. But as a good part of work, but can be used against me if I spend more time working than take care of myself, my other responsibilities too. It's a balance. And Satan has used that against me. And Lucinda, we had many, many talks about that. And um, so you gotta, you gotta be balanced. You gotta do the right thing. And so, but also, we've gotta also incline our ear to understanding. That word incline, incline means to open up our ears and listen that we can be able to understand the right and the wrong. But then also, priorities. What are your priorities? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Uh, and so as a believer, then we have a list of priorities, and everything we do is based upon that list of priorities. Um, so we have prioritized right things, and then honor God with our heart, honoring him with how we think, how we act, how we're honoring him, not just with our words, but also how we act. But then also purity, purity. Doing the right thing. The main characteristic of God, he is holy. He says, be ye holy for I am holy. That's his number one characteristic. He is holy. And so in Isaiah chapter 6, after he had been listening, uh, the prophet Isaiah had been listening to the king, had been listening to the king instead of listening to God, and then God had removed that obstacle. He says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. He had to say, whoa, I need to get some things right in my life. But then also, not just purity, but you've got to believe in God. And it's a matter of faith and pursuing faith and um, working on our faith. Faith is a muscle. Faith is an action word. Right behind me is 151 action words right here. Right here. You just don't say, I want this many boxes and wiggle our noses and do a little dance. And boom, all these boxes come full of things. It don't happen that way. I, I was telling uh, folks this morning that when I came in here and I saw this thing, I did a little bit of happy dance. And someone said, why don't you take a picture? You don't want to see me dancing, okay? <laughs> no. <laughs> then I said, call the doctor. The guy's having spasms up there. Who knows? <laughs> I don't want to see that. And so but I did a little happy dance and just praise the Lord. And, you know, and I've got, it, got to give God the glory. But I've got to, I've got to also... Uh, recognize your faith and what you as a church combined has done to get us to this point. And so we've got 151 boxes. We've raised over $500 already. So we just need $1,000 from now and next month to come in to take care of all these boxes. Can it happen? Yes, it can. It's faith. Faith, when we, when we started this earlier this year, we said, how are we going to do? I have no idea. And stuff started coming in and coming in. And coming in, and coming in, and the biggest thing is that I, I was telling some folks at work about I was bragging on you, and uh, I said we started the month of September, saying you know what, we're going to take a big leap of faith. We're going to we're going to get enough material for fifty more boxes in two and a half months. How long did it take you to get the first hundred? About two and a half months, maybe three. Can you do it with God? Anything is possible. And then when I started, how many, oh, I, I bothered Ruth so much. <laughs> how many items do we have? How many, are you sure? And I'd call her, is this the exact number? And I drove her nuts. Yes, yeah, she had explained to me. <laughs> Make it as clear as mud so I can be able to figure it all out. <laughs> so every week I would, I would badger how many we have. So this way I would be able to go and get all the, get all the numbers. And you look at those numbers from almost 900 down to zero in five weeks. Can God provide a table in the wilderness? God can. It's a matter of stepping out. The nation of Israel would not have experienced deliverance if they didn't put the feet in the water. If they would not have trusted God and said, I want you to walk through that water, and they said, nope, we don't want our feet wet, then they would not have seen the waters open up and then walk on dry ground. So it all starts with faith. You've got to take that first step. 
God says, this is what I want, but you'll never experience it unless you say, okay, God, I'm not sure how this is going to work out, but I will, I will be willing to believe that you can do what you say I can do, is that although I don't believe in myself, I don't believe it's going to happen because I can't see it, but if you say to do it, I'm going to try. And that's what happens. When we start to try and we start expanding our faith, God says, now let me show you what I can do now. God's good. And so when you talk about exercising uh, and believing God, I mean, when, when the, the boat was rocking and reeling in the book of Acts and uh, God had met with Paul and Paul told all the people in the boat, said, look, we're, we're going to make it. The boat's not going to make it. And they said, how do you know? I believe God. Because God had told them they're going to get on shore. Very simple, for I believe God. Very simple, and it's very easy to say I believe God when everything's going, going well, when the money's coming in, and every, all the provisions are right there, and everything's going so smooth, but then when things start getting a little rocky, and all of a sudden things aren't going like you want them to, in fact, they're going the opposite way, and it just seemed like the whole, all the walls are surrounding you and closing all in, and you see, I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel, and then we look at around things thinking, man, it ain't going to happen. God says, you got your eyes where they shouldn't be. Get your eyes on me. I can see the big picture. That's So that we talk about the, the aspect of believing God. And then also, while we're believing God, we show we believe our God, God by loving the Lord with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. Once again, these words, faith, hope, Love, charity are action words. Those are not nouns. Those are verbs. And they're like little muscles. And they've got to be exercised. And if they're not exercised, then we start those particular things in our life start to tighten up. And then pretty soon, not just they tighten up, but they lock up. And all of a sudden, they seem like to be just totally ineffective. Why? Because they were not exercised. You've got to exercise your faith. You've got to exercise your love. You've got to exercise your hope. You've got to exercise every aspect of the word of God. And that's what we've got to do. It comes from the heart. Out of the buzzer at the mouth speaketh. Our heart is what guides and directs our steps. But then also, not just believing believe in God, but loving God, but also let God enlighten our eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I may see. Lord, open up my eyes that I can be able to see great and wonderful things from, the, from thy word. Let me, like, like Jesus said, Lord, God, open up their eyes that they can see. When Elisha, when this prophet came and says, look, master, we're surrounded by the enemy. And Elisha says, look, God, open up their eyes and see. While the enemy is out there, he didn't see. But Elisha, the prophet, saw, he saw all the, all the chariots of fire surrounding this, that particular city of Dothan and protecting the prophet. And the, the, the servant said, whoa. Now he said more than that, but that's in our, in our context, okay? <laughs> but if we only saw what God is doing on the other side, I think it would scare us. To see all the different enemies on the attack and seeing the angels of God and all the, the protections of God and the legions of, to see how God protects us, it would blow us away. So the essence, Lord, let me see some things. Lord, give me a forward view. Give me a little, little hint of how great things are going to be. <coughs> And, but then you say, well, what if God, is God going to give us too much of you? No, because it says in the book of 2 Corinthians that God gave Paul, because he had some revelations of God, he gave him a thorn in the flesh. Lest he could, he would get too, too proud of himself and brag about himself. God says, I've got to bring you down a little bit. So we ask God to enlighten our eyes but then also keeping a tender heart by forgiving one another. We live in a world of constant uh, hurting of people, don't we? It's everywhere. And if we choose not to forgive, 
Now, forgiveness is not saying, I'm going to let you walk over, all over me like a carpet. That's not forgiveness. It's not. But you're supposed to be a Christian. Absolutely, I, I can forgive you. But I choose not to allow you to treat me like you treat me. For, forgiveness is defined as this. Me giving up my right to hurt you because you hurt me. That's forgiveness. And they say, well, you've got to forgive and forget. Let me ask you a question. How long is your memory? And when you look at your memory, how many of those thoughts in your memory go back to things that were negative, how people treated you? Forgive and forget. I just choose not to bring it up all the time. Stuff. Because the nature of mankind is to defend ourselves. The nature of mankind is to attack. The book of Romans says, and I've had to quote this verse lots of time, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When you see God repay other people for how they're treating you, they will. It's a whole lot better you did than I did it. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, the Bible says, but, but they're spiritual. The Bible says, look at Isaiah chapter 54, Isaiah 54. I didn't want to misquote this one. Isaiah 54, verse 17. <clears throat> this is the verse I've used many times in the ministry. Isaiah 54, verse 17 says this. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. It doesn't say that if you're going to serve the Lord that no one's going to like, not like you. That no one's going to gossip about you. That no one's going to seek to try to hurt you. It never says that. The weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. It may be there. It may be um, vindicated against you. But it says, And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. I think I've told you this before. Well, send her parents they were in Yates Center and they were young in the ministry he had a radio program and um, he was pastoring a little church in uh, Bible Baptist Church in, in Yates Center and um, the Lord was blessing the church and then there was someone that was in the community that didn't like to see that church prosper because of ba some bad situation before Lucinda's dad started pastoring so she started going around the community, number one, saying that I've had an affair with that man. Just openly gossiping, lying about him. Then saying other things about him. And when it got back to him, they started praying, Lord, you know that's not true. And Lord, help me be gracious enough that if I see her, that Lord, that I don't say the things I'm not supposed to say. What happened was after he gave that to the Lord, now he's a lot gracious man than I was, I would have been. The woman come down with throat cancer. Before she wasn't able to talk, she went before the church, asked if she can stand before the church, talk to the deacons, because he said, I'm not talking to you, you talk to them. Can I stand up for the church to confess? What are you going to confess? That I lied. I tried to take down this church and that pastor. Get up there and say that. She got it right with the church, with herself. Basically, mind say, say, Lord, I will repay. And every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. And look at the last part of verse 17. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. When you're a servant of the Lord, the Lord's going to protect you. God's going to take care of you. And so when you think about that, is that, okay, Lord, help me. And, and I talked to him because the center brought up a lot of different stories. And they tried to starve him out. And, and uh, it just, it's just amazing when you see how God provides I mean, she, to this date, before she passed away, would not eat zucchini. Why? Because every day her mom was given zucchini and she made zucchini in every form or fashion 
She said, I ate it, was thankful for it, but I prayed that God would give me something else. And some in the community gave him a ham. Lucinda's dad was highly allergic to any pork products. He ate the ham without any type of, any type of repercussions. It was all done, and God provided for the family. They're righteous of me, saith the Lord. And as believers, it's very easy to go on the attack, isn't it? And I've got relatives like that. I mean, they're the bull in the china closet, and they'll, they'll get you with the horns if they want to. Stop. Don't. Calm down. Let God take care of it. But I don't have that much patience. God does. Let him take care of it. So he understands that um, forgiveness is, I'm going to give that, that to you. I'm going to be kind and say, God, they belong to you. Do with you do with them as you want, but I'm not going to go down that path either. Because I know my mom say, two wrongs doesn't make a right, does it? And so we got to understand is that not just have a tender heart by forgiving others, but then also asking God to examine our hearts. Lord, search my heart. Go through my heart and see if there's anything wrong in there. And if there is, show me, reveal it to me so I can get it right with you. Why? Because when we allow things to clutter in our lives, it hinders our relationship with God. We got to keep that, we got to keep that open. But then also, we must obey from the heart, not just outwardly. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Obey from the heart. Verse 17 says this out of Romans chapter 6. And this is what we're picking up from the last two weeks. Verse 17 says this. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin before, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered you. Being then made free from sin or sin's penalty, you became the servants of righteousness. Before you were walking in as a servant of sin, then when you were given the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, that form of doctrine that you were told, you accepted that by you accepting that for the heart man believe in unrighteous, and with the mouth confession is made in salvation, Romans chapter 10, verse 10, from that time on, for that form of doctrine that you believe, that all of a sudden, instead of being a servant of sin, you became a servant of God. And as you begin to grow and as you begin to learn, you started to obey more the scriptures because you have someone in your life that is helping you understand what he's trying to tell us how to act. That's the spirit of God. And so when we're dealing with our hearts, we're dealing with our lives, it's a matter of who's in control. Are we in control or is God control in control? One thing is, um, if you listen to certain types of denominational pastors, they will talk to, they will talk and they preach about getting more of the Holy Spirit, getting more of God, get more of this. You and I get everything we need at the moment of salvation. The matter is, does God have every part of us that he can implement those things into our lives? And how do we do that? By obeying that form of doctrine. Everything starts with the gospel. Everything starts with whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's where it starts. That's the dividing line. That's that, where that scarlet thread goes across for people. They have to make a choice. Are they going to cross over and accept the, what's on the other side of the scarlet thread, or are they going to reject it? That's, where, that's, that, that's that line of demarcation. And so by obeying, more than just giving lip service, but by how we are acting. But then also, we must submit to the Holy Spirit work in our hearts. Look at Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7.
Verse 51. It was after this particular situation with the Jews that God put the Jews up on the shelf, hardened their hearts, blinded them, and sent Paul to the Gentiles. You see, the Jews were given three chances to believe in the Messiah. John the Baptist, then Jesus, then Stephen. After that, God says, one strike, two strikes, three strikes. You're going to go to the, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. That's where Peter's effectiveness begins to wane. And we don't hear as much about Peter. And then you see the rise of Paul from his salvation all the way through the end of the scriptures. It says in verse 51 of Acts chapter 7. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, what's Jesus doing now? He's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. We see here he's standing. Why do you think he's standing? He's ready to receive him into his house. And we know when Jesus comes and gets us, he's not sitting, he's standing. So we just got to wait for him to stand. We just got to wait for him to say, okay, I'm done sitting. Okay, I'm going to go get the children right now. And behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Huh, who is this man named Saul? Because Paul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Say, why didn't he die? Because the Christian never dies. He keeps on going. It's kind of like you close your eyes from this world and you open up our eyes to a better world. But as Stephen was preaching, they resisted the, the preaching, but then also not just the actual preaching, but then so, as the word of God is going forth, you have the Holy Spirit talking to the heart. It's that inward voice that makes us sometimes uncomfortable because God is saying, we need to work on this. I don't know if some of you were here when I was a kid, and I didn't like the game because my hands would get shaky. It's called Operation. And you put all those different things in there, and the idea was is you take your, your little pinchers to get all the way down in there and pull that thing out with the, the sides. Now, hearing that nose, uh, see that nose going, man. See, as the Word of God goes forth, I'm just not speaking. The word of God is going forth and speaking to our inner man. And sometimes he's saying, let me work on that particular life. And that might be why we feel a little uncomfortable. Maybe there's something that's that, that just not setting right. It's the spirit of God trying to work on us. And that's why we've got to be willing to accept what he has to say. Now, I've told you this since day one. You bring your Bible, you take notes. You study to show yourself approved unto God. And if there's ever a time that I ever say anything that goes against this book, you better stay close to this book. You better stay close to this book. I'll do my best and to be able to say the right things and ask God to lead me and guide me, but I would never, ever want to lead anyone ever astray based upon my personality or my ability to speak. That's why I have to have spiritual ears to hear. And if God tells you to do something, 
then do it. Now, I've been, I've been here long enough to see people resist the, the, during the invitation. I've seen people during the preaching see people very, very uncomfortable. I've seen people just close their eyes and say, just kind of shake their head and grit their teeth saying, it's just almost like saying, I just wish you would just shut up. I can't take this anymore. But when the Spirit of God is speaking to us, we've got to be willing to listen. They did not listen. They got angry, and they lashed out at the speaker. Nobody had to say, because what he was saying was the truth. It was the Jews that had the opportunity through the prophets, and they killed the prophets. Killed them, because they didn't like what they had to say. And because of that, they allowed the philosophies of the world to take, to take root in a lot of the Jewish philosophies. And God says, I want you not to resist, and I want you to listen. And let me, who has made you and knows everything about you and knows what it's going to take to heal you and strengthen you or guide you or replace you, let me take care of because I'm called the great physician for a reason. You know, and I'm, I'm, I've got a good physician. I'm thankful for what I have. I've had him for like 15 years, which is unusual in Southeast Kansas. And we were talking about that. I had to get a, a, a snap a physical to be a bus driver because some paperwork didn't fall in. I had to have it that day. He said, you need to go get it. So I called my doctor up. Now, this is also unusual. When I called him up, I said, I need a physical. How soon can I get in? And the secretary says, can you be here in 15 minutes? Has anyone ever had that type of experience? <laughs> I didn't either. I said, excuse me? I got to clean the wax out of here. What did you say? 15 minutes. She said, you already wasted one minute. Get going. Yes, ma'am. And it all, it all, everything came together. It all worked out. And we were talking about the thing he said. You know, one of the biggest frustrations I have as a doctor, I said, what's that? He said, I cannot heal everyone that comes in these doors. He said, I wish I could be able to have the ability of my hands and my mind to be able to take care of everyone's problems, but that's not my job. My job is to analyze and hopefully give you some insight of what you, and hopefully give you the right type of advice to get you to that point that if you can be healed, get healed. He said, like I said, I couldn't heal Lucinda because of the cancer, but I get you to a point where you can be able to understand it more. And he says, I, I, I just go home sometimes and just so frustrated. He said, my wife had to say, hey, are you doing your best? Yes. Are you helping people? Yes. Then you cannot do anything. You are not God. She says, he's being reminded of that. There's a little person that can do it. Oh, that, that's God. And so we can't resist when the spirit of God who makes us, helps us, and guides us unto all truth is there to, to guide us. But then also, we must be diligent to study God's word. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> now, I'm sure you didn't have to deal with I did. Man, I was, every nine weeks, I hated taking that piece of cardboard that was colored with the school's name at the top and my handwritten name was in the middle and the teacher's name was underneath that what grade it was and on the inside were these different categories and what type of A, B, C, D, or F I was gonna, I hated every nine weeks. And I think the worst type of torture was is that the teacher would give it in an envelope and say, take this home and have your parents sign it, bring it back tomorrow. I hated that. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to my own death. I'm just going to give you the sword. Here it is. And then I would come up with these excuses. Why would you get this grade? Why? Well, the teacher don't like me. Well, the teacher's not paid to like you. The teacher's there to teach. Hopefully you're good enough that they will like you. Or the teacher, the teacher's out to try to fail me. Okay, I'll schedule a meeting with the teacher. No, 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 no. I'll, 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 just, I'll just do better. I despised every nine weeks. 
And I despise parent-teacher meetings because mom and dad made sure that they went to all of our parents, te to our teachers, every nine weeks. Mom, we don't have to go. It's going to be okay. No one want to find out what's going on. Mom, I can tell you everything's going to be good, but your grades are not good. I will get them up. Don't worry about that. I promise I'll do better. And mom and dad would say, you know what? I appreciate your promise, but as an adult, I need to see more than just a promise. And lo and behold, after we left, I was always afraid thinking what kind of torture they're going to do because the teacher told them the truth. And everything I said was almost the truth, but just a little bit of embellishment. I hated report cards. And, you know, as believers, one day there's going to be a report card handed out at the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, it says study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. That we'd have the ability to be able to look at this book, and as we are reading it, that God would be able to take it as a flashlight and that word is a lamp before my feet and a light before my path. Is that we take the word of God and light our ways, take every step of the way to get where we need to go. And um, to avoid the different traps and the pitfalls of what life has to offer. Look at he Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says this. For the word of God is quick, it's alive, and powerful, dynamos, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing us even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This book right here, lined up to all of us, is a mirror, the book of James taught. It's a mirror. And it's a truth mirror is that if we look at the word of God, we look at ourselves in this mirror, we realize, woe is me, I'm a man that is undone. I need a lot of work done in my life. And as a believer, if we have the right type of heart, not just are we asking God to check our hearts out, but Lord, give us something that'll help clean it out and get us back on the right path, and that's the word of God. This book right here, as D.L. Moody said, this book will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book, D.L. Moody used to say. And so we need to be diligent to study God's word. Be diligent to study God's word. And so also, let's look at one more. Look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We must be willing to repent with humility. Repent with humility. Romans chapter 2. So what are you talking about with the heart? If there's things in our lives that God reveals to us that we need to correct, repentance is recognizing it, admitting it, and working on getting that taken care of. I'm sorry is not good enough. There's got to be some action behind the I'm sorry. Romans chapter 2, verses 3 through five, three through 6 says this. Romans 2, verse 3 says this. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Paul is writing to the Roman church saying, look, that if you are judging people for what they're doing, and you are doing exactly what you're judging on, judging them on, you're going to get the same type of judgment. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? You know, we look at God when it comes to his, our behaviors that are not right, as he's, he's ready to zap us or whoop us all the time. Sometimes it's his goodness that causes us to remember, man, God's been good to me. Maybe I need to get that thing right with him. Leading us to repentance. I'd much rather have God be good to me and recognize, hey, I better get that thing corrected than God take me to the woodshed. 
that the fact is that with humility, when we are presented, when we're doing things wrong, it's a matter of saying, okay, Lord, I was wrong, I've done it. There's one thing I learned from one of my professors from college is that when we are confronted with our sins, first thing is that I was wrong, I'm sorry, and I will change. This thing of sorry, I hear that a lot from different kids on the bus. This one boy, he's a good kid, just got too much energy in that little body. It's just kind of the energy kind of pops out through his body. And I have to tell him, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Behave, get quieter. You need to pay attention. And he'll just, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. And so Friday I said, what does sorry mean? I don't know. Why would he say it? I just thought if I'd say it, it was going to be okay. Said, but you're not changing. And he said, sorry. I said, who's sorry? That seat's sorry? The bus is sorry? The clouds is... No, I'm sorry. Okay, first, that's a good thing. You admit what you've done wrong. But secondly, how are you going to change so this way that sorrow turns into action? Well, I guess I need to do better. I said, guessing ain't going to happen. I need something a little bit more concrete. I need something to be able to say, we see a change. And so Friday afternoon, he gets on the bus. He looks at me, he said, did you talk to the principal about me? No. Why? Because I got in trouble. Sorry, I didn't tell her about this one. I said, so what the, what the principal say? You need to start, instead of just saying sorry, you need to start acting better with that sorry. Let your actions speak louder than your words. Okay, so now what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to sit in this front seat, and I'm not going to move. Promise? He said, I may move just a little bit. <laughs> I said, uh, are you sure? Well, that little bit may turn. And he said, well, it may just kind of go like this. And I'm going to have a hard time. I said, well, why don't you start pinching that, that, that action down there, and let's not worry about that expanding. Huh? I said, I want to see it like this, not like this. Okay. <laughs> he gets off the bus. He said, Jim, I said, what? I said, he said, it was like this. I said, did you have a hard time? He said, it's just like something on the inside said, let me out. I got to go. <laughs> I said, I said, you know, I know how you feel, buddy, but I'm proud of you for doing your best to keep whatever's on the inside, inside. Now, when you go outside that bus, be as loud as you want to, go as crazy as you want to, just don't hurt yourself or anybody else. Right. <laughs> he said, I got a whole weekend to get all that out of there. I said, please use every moment to get all that out of there. His problem is I wake up, that, that thing's still there. I put him to sleep, do something. <laughs> And, you know, and in that, that same context, we have that thing inside of us that wants to go crazy sometimes. And sometimes we got to put the clamps on that thing and not just recognize that it's doing, we're doing wrong, but we're going to put a, we're going to correct that. And it's a, we got a whole life to work on that. That's why when you, you mess up and you do better and you mess up, don't get so frustrated because that thing's been there a whole lot longer than you try to correct it. And it's going to take a while to get it taken care of. That's why you have life. That's why you have grace. That's why you have forgiveness. That's why you have the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why you have God looking over you and loving you anyway. An amazing God we serve. And so it's a matter of the heart. Is the heart of the matter. Father, bless us as we in the morning worship service. Speak to hearts, dear Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless your service. Start in about 14, 15 minutes. You are dismissed.